Hi, and welcome to the next lecture unit in the lecture chapter on information theory. And in this lecture chapter, um, I'll connect um, the entropy concept that we've studied before more in a probabilistic sense um, to the um, setting of optimal code length construction when transmitting messages over a channel. Um, in a certain sense, this is kind of a bonus unit. You could skip this if you're really only interested in understanding um, information theory with uh, regard to statistical inference and machine learning, of course. Um, on the other hand, this is kind of where information theory comes from. And as I think uh, the uh, information theory concepts themselves are not that simple to understand and to are not that simple to connect with um, plausible and intuitive concepts, um, I think understanding this background here does make sense and I, I guess motivate you to um, still look into this and um, understand this anyway. Okay, let's start. So as I said, we are now um, switching context considerably. This might be a little bit unusual for most of you. I, I guess you need to give me a little bit of rope here and um, yeah, try to kind of um, get into the context as good and as quickly as possible. So I'll try to make it as uh, easy um, and um, basic as I can here in this uh, short lecture unit. Um, so we'll now look into a subfield of information theory, which is known as source coding. Um, so with a source, I here mean any type of system or process or the abstraction of those um, that generates messages or information. And our general goal is now to um, create codes to represent these messages, technical codes, uh, numerical codes, so we can um, store or transmit these messages over a communication channel such as a radio or fiber opt optic cables. Huh? Um, and for example, I mean, I guess you all know this, that we usually use binary strings to encode these types of messages um, because it might be expensive to transmit these messages. Um, it seems to be natural now to um, address the problem of co being able to construct um, an efficient or um, potentially optimal code of minimal average length. So we don't want to spend um, more bits than necessary to encode our messages. So um, let's try to formalize this a little bit more. So there's not a lot of notation here that's necessary. Um, first of all, I'll um, assume that we're given um, a certain dictionary or alphabet of messages, of message symbols. Um, so we have like a finite set of all potential messages we want to transmit. And then there's a binary code and a binary code is simply a mapping from all of the symbols in X to um, code words of binary strings. And I'll use a running example here, a super, super simple one where our dictionary only consists of um, for animal related words. So maybe we only want to talk about dogs, cats, fishes, and birds. I guess we cannot um, formulate uh, that many interesting um, sequences with these words, but uh, it's a simple example. Um, so we can study um, the basic concepts here in this lecture unit. And we will now simply use a um, binary string encoding of always length two. So dog, we might encode with a double zero, cat, we could encode with a zero one, fish with a one zero, and bird with a one one. And then we can easily now encode our source symbols here uniquely and precisely with these code words. We can concatenate all of these code words. Um, and to transmit this sentence here, we would now transmit this encoded string of length eight. And obviously, at the receiving end of the channel, I can also uniquely decode this sentence into, again, this um, sequence of source symbols by simply mapping um, yeah, these strength, st strings of length two to the uh, associated um, symbols from our dictionary and basically just using these rules now in reverse. So far, so good and so simple. Um, what we now want to talk about is how many of these bits are we using on average when we are transmitting messages for a given source over um, a channel? And that means we now have to talk a little bit about how likely are all of these words. How often do we want to use the word dog? How often do we want to use the word cat, fish or bird? 
And in order for us to um, model this in a very, very simple fashion, we'll now simply regard our message emitting source as a random variable that spits out random symbols from our dictionary. And um, so basically, um, our um, source is nothing more than a discrete distribution where we have one probability associated with each um, symbol um, in our dictionary of messages. And maybe our source, I don't know, is a person and that person likes to talk a bit more about dogs than about cats and uh, also more about cats than fishes and birds. So you'd use this discrete um, categorical distribution here to model the probability distribution of our source. And um, we can also talk about the length of a binary string. Well, I guess we could that before. I'll, we'll just using notation now for that. So I'll use this capital L of X here to uh, simply count the number of bits in a corresponding code word. And often it now makes sense to visualize um, the whole thing. So I'll um, often use this type of visualization here where on this, I don't know, X axis, you can see the number of bits used in um, the code word representation of the symbol. And here on the Y axis and, and this length here, you will see the um, uh, probability that that um, message has in our source probability distribution. And I should also mention that all of these visualizations and many of the examples have been taken from this uh, super nice uh, tutorial by Chris Ola, which is um, where the title is, I think, a visual explanation of information theory and what I, what I can uh, highly, highly recommend to um, read even in addition to this uh, lecture unit here and the other lecture units, um, although we cover um, quite a considerable part of it um, already here in the slides. So um, we can now we now have some notation to talk about this um, you know, the, the length here of the code words and of course now it makes absolutely natural sense um, to calculate something like the expected length of a message which is emitted by our source. So this is just the expectation of L of X um, where X is now this random variable here that represents our source and you can now go through this super simple calculation. Um, but I guess for this specific source that we're currently discussing here in our, or the specific encoding scheme, I should say, in our example here, it, I mean, it's kind of obvious what comes out of this um, expectation calculation as we are using string, strings of length two always for all symbol, the average string length is of course, again, two bits. Um, what you could also kind of do is, um, I mean, look a little bit again here into this um, visualization with the rectangles and what, I, what we will also, we should kind of also now see for some later examples uh, to make a bit more sense is that as this is here, the length of the code word, and this is the associated probability of the code word, the area here um, of this partial rectangle is exactly, um, reflects exactly the value of this product here in our expectation computation. So obvious question now is, can we do better? Can we construct more intelligent codes, more efficient codes, instead of always using the same number of bits for each code word? So how about variable length codes? Um, where we, I guess the obvious idea is to assign shorter codes to more likely messages with higher probability and longer ones to less likely messages. So in, on average, maybe now we are using less bits because for some of the symbols, that are generated very, very often by the source, we're just using not that many bits. And we can then kind of um, allow ourselves to use more bits for messages, which are only very rarely generated by the source. So before we can study that, um, let's talk a little bit about um, the problem of us being able to also uniquely decode the, the messages at the receiving end of the channel because that might be actually be problematic if we're using these variable length codes, because now we can't kind of regularly split up our received code string here anymore, because we don't know exactly how many bits are currently being used um, for a certain uh, word that we are receiving, right? Because it's a variable length. So that creates a problem for us because what we would 
normally naturally do is we would here always study uh, and analyze the beginning of this string and then we would try to peel off um, these encoding rules here in reverse. So for example, here we are receiving now zero and we see that there is this dog encoding rule and that ends with a zero. So this first word here is probably going to be dog. Uh, then we receive another zero. So maybe that's again a dog. Uh, then we receive a one. So um, uh, let me check that. So that actually might be a cat. And then we receive a zero one. Okay, and now that doesn't work anymore. So okay, maybe we have to backtrace now a little bit, we receive a dog, we receive a, another dog, and then we don't peel off a one for a cat, but we uh, peel off a one one for a bird that works. Um, here we now see a fish. Um, and then we see a dog and a cat. But I guess you could have already seen um, that there's a certain um, um, ambiguity now involved because I could also um, I could also generate now a um, alternative decoded sequence where I first peel off a dog again, then I peel off a fish. Uh, this is zero one here, then I peel off a um, cat, then again a fish, and then another fish. And I think it's also now after we have run through this example, pretty obvious what the problem here is. I um, in order for us to always be able to uniquely peel off these rules here in the reverse, one property that we are going to request of our code is that it's prefix free, or we also sometimes just call this a prefix code in short. And with that, with that I mean that um, it should never happen that um, the um, used code word for a certain symbol is also used as a prefix for another for another code word. And this is exactly what happens here with dog and fish and it also happens here with cat and bird where these code words here are also kind of appear as prefixes in these other code words. And that um, results in us not being able to uniquely um, decode a received binary string. If the code is actually a prefix code and is prefix free, um, it's obvious that we can always peel off code words in a unique manner. And the worst thing that could actually happen is that at some point we'd only, we would stop and no rule uh, would be applicable. And in that case, our code word would just be simply be illegal. Yeah, it shouldn't have been generated by the source anyway, or I guess an error in transmission might have happened on the channel. I, I very certainly don't want to discuss this here. So I'll, all, I'll always assume that these code words are uh, totally valid and have been correctly generated by our source. And in that case, for a prefix code, I can always uniquely decode this. Um, so from now on, I will always assume that if I'm studying a variable length code, that's always that variable length code is always a prefix code. Now some quick calculation. What that actually means, um, and especially also in, in uh, terms of how many potential code words there are, are actually available to me to exploit in order to construct efficient codes. So first of all, it's pretty obvious for codes of for code words of exactly L, there's always exactly two L possible words, possible binary words of length L. That's super obvious, right? We have L binary um, decisions available to us for each position, and therefore it's two to the L possible code words of exactly length L. We can also calculate how many code words are there of um, either L or less than L. So that's just the sum over all of these guys. So this is uh, two to the L plus one minus two. The reason for that formula is just the geometric sum. So we are summing up over two to the um, two to the one, two to the two, two to the two, two to the three, until two to the L. Then we just form the geometric sum and at the end we still have to subtract one because we are not adding up two to the zero because we're not using a code words of length zero which is empty. Yeah. So um, that was pretty simple um, and kind of boring. Now one thing that's actually very relevant 
when we are discussing these prefix variable length codes. And that's um, the problem that if we are using code words of very, very short length, which is in a certain sense interesting to us because we want to save bits, right? And we also want to use these code words of very short length to assign them to symbols of very high probability, right? So that with high probability, we are using not too many bits. If we are using these very short words, short code words, we can run now a quick calculation of how many other code words we are not, not allowed now to use anymore. And what you can see here is that if you're, for example, using a code word of length two, so for example, this zero one code word here and assigning that to a symbol of very high probability, and then therefore we're only using two bits for that symbol, then what happens is that you can't use all of these code words anymore, more like 010, 011, or longer code words, which use this prefix here of 01. And if you look at this graphical um, representation here of our potential code words, what you can see is that you are using, uh, that, sorry, that you're losing all of these guys here yeah, in this rectangle of infinite length and you are now throwing out um, approximately, well, not approximately, you are throwing out exactly one quarter of all potential code words if you would only um, count code words of um, length three and larger. And so in total, it's still approximately about a uh, fourth of potential code words you're now throwing out um, because here uh, compared to what happens here, um, not a man, yeah, not uh, not too many kind of code words live in this left-hand side area. Um, so in general, you are approximately throwing out one over two to the l potential code words, and exactly if you only consider code words of uh, larger than l that you now have to discard and that you cannot use anymore to assign them to symbols. And well, there's code words in there of length three, of length four, and so on, which are still potentially attractive to you because they are not that much longer than this special code word here of length two that you are assigning. So the, sh the shorter you know, the code word is you're choosing in this prefix code to re represent a symbol, the more you're throwing away. In the extreme case, if you just want to use a one length um, code word here, just the zero or just the one, you're immediately throwing out 50% of all of the other code words, which you cannot use now now anymore in your um, coding scheme. So keeping that in mind, we now kind of have to construct a certain trade-off, right? Where for very, very likely words, we're using super short, short chord words. Um, on the other hand, we don't want to make them too short um, because we're throwing out too many chord words. And I'll not like go into the exact construction of the optimal code now, but I want to simply discuss one example here where I'm using um, the zero now for the dog, the one zero for the cat, the one one zero for the fish, and the one 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 for the bird. So I'm using a variable length code of sometimes one, sometimes two, and sometimes three bits. And I guess you can easily check that this code here is prefix free. Uh, well, yeah, the zero doesn't occur as a prefix, and the one zero also doesn't occur as, occur as a prefix. Um, and we can now again here look at this visualization. Um, we are here we have the length of the code word. Here we have the probability, the occurrence probability of our symbol, of our message. And this area here again reflects now this computation and expectation. And this is now, I think, not totally obvious what comes out of this. So I think we just have to go through the calculation. We have to go through the motions. And, and we can see that this actually creates, on average, um, or that this um, that the average length of this coding scheme is actually a bit better than what we have seen before. This two bits average length for the um, much simpler regular uh, length code, where we are always exactly using two bits per code word. Um, so first of all, apparently now we have succeeded. We have constructed something that's better. So apparently that's possible, at least for some examples. Um, I think if you also study this pattern here a little bit, you can kind of already guess how such a code is being constructed. So here uh, in the first position of the product, you always uh, see the occurrence probability of the message 
And here you now see the length of my constructed code word that I'm using. And if you just look at this a bit more precisely, you can see that what we are here doing is that we are effectively calculating the log of base with reference to base two of this occurrence probability. And this is how my specific example here is constructed. Um, and first of all, apparently that seems to work. That seems to construct a better average length for this code, for this example. Also, interestingly, this formula here is exactly the formula that we have introduced before for the entropy of a discrete probability distribution. And um, now um, this very, very well-known source coding theorem of Shannon's exists, uh, which is also sometimes called the noiseless coding theorem. And that tells us um, that this is a valid construction and that this is also the, an optimal construction policy. So if we are using um, or if we are assigning a code of length um, log of one divided by P for a code word or a symbol, uh, sorry, for a symbol with probability P, then the average length of that code is obviously the entropy and that this is optimal. We can't construct better codes um, with a better average length. Um, there's also practical algorithms like Huffman coding that we can in practice now use to construct these codes. I don't want to discuss this anymore. I think this is fine. So again, Shannon's source coding theorem tells us if we use this entropy construction or if we calculate the entropy um, for a certain probability distribution and we uh, kind of match in our minds this um, probability distribution with this message emitting source, the entropy itself is the best possible average length for a coding scheme that can be constructed for such a source.